You're listening to another ambitious entrepreneur network.com podcast, the voice for entrepreneurs and small business. Now, onto the show. Welcome to the Christian Entrepreneurs Podcast conversations with Christian entrepreneurs to inspire and empower Christian business owners to walk strongly in their faith. Well, build a thriving business that honors him in every way. Now, over to your host, Anne-Marie Cross. And welcome to another episode of the Christian Entrepreneurs Podcast, brought to you by Podcasting with Purpose, helping you to stand out, to be heard, and to be seen as an influential person in your industry. And I'm your host, Anne-Marie Cross, also known as the Podcasting Queen. Now, my guest today says, I am a ferocious competitor. Never forget to compete with honour, with compassion and with charity. And joining me on today's show is Ralph Brown. Ralph was the captain of the I Am Second Wounded Hero Voyage, the smallest powerboat to cross the Atlantic in honour of the men who gave their lives during Operation Eagle Claw. Now, Ralph is currently putting together the first annual, first ever powerboat race around the world, a 27,000 mile plus powerboat race that stops in 20 harbours along the way. Now, on today's show, Ralph is going to share why competing with honour, with compassion and charity is important to him. He's also going to talk about what it is like to be faced with almost certain failure and potential death, as well as how to push on even when you want to quit. So welcome to the show, Ralph. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. You are so very welcome. So for the, those of you who are watching li the live stream today, we do apologise that the internet is, uh, I mean, we're talking to Ralph across the other side of the planet. So every now and again, the video may lag, but uh, the audio version of the podcast is going to capture everything that Ralph shares today. So Ralph, share a little bit about your backstory, if you would. We shared that you, um, you know, you're the captain of the I Am Second Wounded Hero Voyage, a small, the small smallest powerboat to cross the Atlantic. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit that took you up to that journey to, to start that. Well, the, the reality is um, years ago I was in the Marine Corps and uh, they called me up and said, get your behind back on base. Uh, you're going to Iran. Now, you're probably a little too young to remember this, but in 1979, the American embassy in Iran uh, was taken over by terrorists. And they told me I was going to go and get back on base. I remember I had to be back on base by 2300 hours, 11 o'clock at night. And I ran over to my girlfriend's house and hung out there looking at the clock to the last minute because I'm going to Iran. <laughs> and so um, anyways, I raced off to the base and, and got there on time so I could get, you know, log in at, at 2300 hours. I was on standby red alert. The truth is I did absolutely nothing. Okay, absolutely nothing. Uh, but on April 24th, uh, 1980, the United States sent a group of men to go uh, take back the hostages. And there was a little confusion in the desert. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But uh, a chopper uh, backed up and hit a, uh, a, excuse me, not backed up, went forward and hit a C-130 and killed eight men. Mm -hmm. And three men were U.S. Marines, John Harvey, George Holmes, and Dewey Johnson. So at the time. I felt like they died in my place because they told me I was going and I didn't go. So I got on my hands and knees and promised God that I'd make sure that they were not forgotten. Yeah. And so that's only the first of several steps we have planned um, that we're doing in honor, not just the Marines, but all eight men uh, that gave their lives that day. Uh, uh, you know, the, the Air Force, they gave their life just as much as the Marines did. Okay. Mm -hmm. Either way. But, um, but at the Marine Corps, it was a big deal at that time. So we, um, I, I, years ago, I hit a boat. I hit a rock while out boating, and I broke a motor uh, with my kids and, and a friend and his kids. And I got consumed with the idea of making a better boat, one that could run in that much water. Now, for those of you that are just listening, my fingers are up about two and a half inches or so, and was safe enough to cross the ocean. So when I told people you can do that, they're all like, you're nuts. Okay. You can't make a boat. You want to make a shallow water boat? We can get boats that can run in shallow water. 
and, and safe boats are on the ocean. You can get those too, but you're not going to get both. Well, you, I'm a little hard headed, you know, U.S. Marine. You can't tell them nothing. OK, just a little hard headed. So I went out and I raised some money, found some investors, raised some money and and uh, started testing and testing and testing. I did it wrong 16 times, 16 total failures. And then I got it. And once we got it to work, we were able to then modify it a whole bunch of times. So we had about another 20 or 30 modifications off that original. But then we started getting these boats that could run. And we've got video of our boats running in one inch water, not two and a half inches, but one inch of water. And the same boat, I, you know, I took to, first time I took it from um, North Carolina to Bermuda. So those of you that don't know, Okay, North Carolina is in the middle of the east coast of the United States. Bermuda is 700 miles straight offshore. And so I had another guy named Patrick coming with me. And we're doing all our last minute testing. I don't just get in the boat and go. People think I'm crazy enough just to get in the boat and go. You have a lot of plans and you mm -hmm. tested it and then tested it and tested it and tested it over and over. So we're doing last minute testing and Patrick's there with us and we've got a reporter from the local re newspaper. He's riding around with us. And um, you, you hear Patrick's phone ring every 10 seconds. And he'd pick it up. He'd stick it up to his... You know, this is back in the flip day phone. He'd flip it open and put it up to his head. And he would, he would say these words over and over and over all day long. It's not as dangerous as you think. It's not as dangerous as you think. And he'd hang up, talk to him for a few minutes. He'd hang up. And then a few minutes later, the phone would ring. And Patrick would say, it's not as dangerous as you can as you think. And so um, anyway, uh, what his mother had done, uh, and this guy's a grown adult, but his mother decided this was something that her grown adult wasn't going to do. He wasn't going to take this boat 700 miles out to sea and back. OK. Um, and so she had called every relative, every friend, everyone you can imagine. And they're all calling Patrick up and saying, <laughs> saying, you know, how dangerous, you can't go, you can't go. So that night, I, you know, we're leaving in the, the following morning, okay? I'm, I'm packing up and leaving the next morning, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm doing all my late night stuff, getting everything all organized. Uh, you know, I'm still at the shop. Uh, I'm not quite ready to go, but almost ready. Uh, and I'm going to drive from my shop in Florida to North Carolina, which is, you know, a day and a half drive. Mm -hmm. there, okay? Um, anyway, so... Uh, my phone rings. It's about eight o'clock at night. It's already dark out. And I look at the caller ID and it says, Patrick, before I answered, I knew what it was going to say. Mm. I answered it and just talked for a minute. It was Patrick saying he's not going. You know, he had some other excuse other than his mom talked him out of it. Yeah. He wouldn't admit to that. But he had some other excuse on why he couldn't go. Now, we've been planning this thing for more than six months. Wow. We're going after a world record the longest ocean voyage in that kind of boat in the history of mankind. And so, you know, you know, we've planned on a long time. And I told him over and over, if you're going to back out, don't wait to the last second. Yeah. So anyways, I go home. My wife says, you look all upset. I said, yeah, I'm upset. Patrick bailed on me. And I really want to have someone to go with me because in case something goes wrong, it's, you know, it's all the Bible says, you know, it's better to have somebody with you when something yeah. goes wrong. You know, you, another person can give you help. And because uh, it's just common sense. Anyway, so um, my wife says, well, why don't you ask your brother Bob, see if he'll go with you. And so, okay, I picked the phone up and I called Bob. Bob's wife, Jill, answers the phone. And I explained to Jill what's going on. And Jill says, he can't go. All right. And, and, and I, hung up. I thought that was the end of it. You know, I don't know what I was going to do. The next morning, I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to do. The phone rings. It's Bob. And um, it, he says, well, Jill said you called last night. What do you want? And I said, I'm going to do on this trip. I'm going to Bermuda. Uh, and uh, I had this whole trip planned. I've already spent money. I bought airline tickets for an advanced team to be waiting on us in Bermuda and, and everything else. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got several thousand dollars already spent. And um, my guy who's going with me kind of bailed. And he said, well, I'll go. And, okay, that's fine. So this is where it's insane. Bob's going camping that night in Atlanta, which is like halfway between our shop in, in Tampa, Florida, and North mm -hmm. Carolina, where I'm going. And he said, just pick me up the next day in Atlanta, just outside Atlanta. No big deal. And so 
Bob calls Jill, his wife. Now, she's a dental hygienist, okay? She works on people's teeth for a living. Bob calls Jill on the phone and says, I'm going with Ralph. And uh, she she objected. He just said, honey, I'm going. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, can you imagine the poor suckers? I mean, they're getting their teeth worked on after that lunch break. <laughs> Jill's mad. <laughs> oh, uh, dear. But anyways, wow. so Bob, I'm picking up Bob halfway in Atlanta on my way. And I'm going to pick him up the next day. We've kind of adjusted everything and uh, uh, on the way. And the phone rings. And I look at him. Bob, Bob's calling me. He said, Ralph, I looked at a map. That's 700 miles. I said, <gasps> yeah, 700 miles. It's a world record. Um, but anyways, he said, can the boat make it? I said, sure. And that was the end of it. At, at that point in time, he never asked another question about it. Wow. And so we ended up making that trip. And then um, well, Guinness Book of World Records said they would not certify it because it was too dangerous. And then there's another organization called the World Record Academy. They did certify it. So then the Guinness said, well, we'll certify it now. But you have to understand is every time you fill out an application with Guinness, it's about $1,000. Huh. Okay. It's free. It's really free. The record is free. The processing is free, too. But there's normal processing and there's accelerated processing. Accelerated processing is about $1,000. So mm. I tried doing it without accelerated processing one time. And three months later, no one had looked at it. Okay. So you really just got to pay that. But they, they did certify it as the longest nonstop ocean voyage in a flat spoke. So we took that boat from Atlanta to, um, to, to Bermuda, then Bermuda to New York City. Mm. And then a, a couple of months later, I got to thinking about honoring uh, the men that I had promised that I would honor and never did. We went to my my stepfather's funeral in Washington, D.C., and he went. He was buried in Arlington National Cemetery. And I'm walking through there with my wife and kids, and they had these two big reefs up, and the reefs are for the men that died in Operation Eagle Claw. Mm. And their names are all all spelled out right there and at that at that time it just hit me like a ton of bricks i had not kept my promise and it had been 29 years and so my kids are saying dad why are you crying i didn't I, i'm not the kind of crying type and their dad why are you crying um because i made them a promise and i didn't keep it mm. so uh i called bob up again he's on top of a roof working in florida some Florida summer on roof. And I said, Hey, Bob, you want to take that same boat with me? To, uh, we're going to go to Germany. We're going to start in Tampa, Florida at McDill, the command center um, for that, for that feature area. It's called, it's, they call it SOCOM, uh, Southern Command. And um, we're going to go from there to the hospital in Germany mm -hmm. uh, where all these men are treated at. And we're going to, anyways. And he said, sure, <laughs> I'll go. Got a lot, Bob. <laughs> He didn't think about it. He didn't debate about it. He didn't ask any questions. He said, sure. Now, when I asked him later about it, he said, I'm on a hot roof in Florida in the summer. Okay. Uh, Florida is real hot, if you didn't know it. Okay. He's on a roof, fixing a roof. And, and he, he, he runs his, his own home repair company where he goes to his homes and repairs homes and stuff. And he said, spending the summer in a boat, spending the summer fixing roofs. Let me think about that. <laughs> I'm going. It's not quick. It was just no big deal. Uh, so um, Bob came with me. Let me show you. Can I share my screen? Yeah, absolutely. I can see that you're so passionate about that. So I, I've loved this story. So uh, go ahead. Um, share the screen. I'm hitting share screen. Okay. Okay, there we go. Screen sharing is easiest with two monitors. I don't know. Um, okay, well, I don't have two two monitors so i'm just going to do this one okay and hopefully i should see something and bring it uh, up on the the screen okay. i'm not seeing um, anything at the I'm moment i'm hitting share okay share my entire screen it's i'm hitting the button but it's not doing anything yeah normally what would happen if it works i, I should be able to see a screen come up Ralph, um, but I'm not seeing it. So 
maybe mm. for some reason because of the internet it's not allowing us to share screen i'm not sure but for, for now did you want to explain what you wanted to share is that kind of the, I'm the, route show that... you the room. Oh. <laughs> oh. one of my favorite pictures is us leaving iceland and yeah. when you see us the boat is full of water i mean fuel fuel and we're leaving iceland uh we're inside a volcano there's an island in the south West corner of Iceland called Vestman Island because they say Vestman instead of West. Mm. But it's Vestman Island, and it's actually inside a volcano. There's a harbor in that, and we're leaving, and it's really calm in that water. And the sides of the boat are only about ten inches off the water line. It's wow. full of fuel. We're carrying um, three hundred and forty-seven thousand gallons of fuel. Uh, three hundred and forty-seven gallons. Excuse me, not thousand. 347 gallons of fuel and a bunch of gear. And so, I mean, all the gear and everything is about 5,000 pounds and we're heading out to sea and we're actually driving into the remnants of a hurricane. Wow. Okay. Um, on our way to this other island and you're going to have to go to a website to see it if you want, I guess. Um, we can I put, it, we can put the link in the show notes and then later Ralph, after you and I have finished speaking, I'll get the link from you and we'll put it in the um, the the, com the comment for about the show. So if people would like to go and see that. I know I certainly would. They can um, go and click on that anyways, link. It's one of my favorite pictures um, yeah. of it. And we're, it's a calm going into the storm. Now, right after that, we almost got killed. And um, <sighs> probably the most dangerous thing. But the other part of my favorite pictures is the first time we're Florida boys. Now, if you understand, we're Florida boys. It doesn't snow in Florida. There's no icebergs in Florida. So we're going off the coast of Canada. First time Bob and I have ever seen an iceberg. In fact, he's driving, I'm sleeping. And I, I said, hey, what's going on? He said, well, I've seen a couple of these big white yachts. They weren't white yachts, they were icebergs. <laughs> but anyway, so um, we, uh, we've seen these big white yachts. So anyways, we finally got up close to one that was really big. I mean, really big. And Bob got off on his surfboard in the water. Now, my mom only raised one total nut. I wasn't getting in that water. <laughs> it was cold. I mean, we had wetsuits and stuff. Yeah. But he's in there on that surfboard taking pictures. And you can see the icebergs like this big. I'm trying to get both my hands in the picture. Okay. It's this big. And the boat is this big. I mean, the wow. boat is tiny and compared to that iceberg. It's a gigantic iceberg. And uh, so we went water skiing around, a uh, wakeboarding, actually, around the iceberg, too, because we're Florida boys. I mean, we don't know. We've never seen icebergs. It was a, we, were, we had a press conference we were supposed to be at in the next town, and we, we totally blew that to press conference. We spent five hours taking pictures of this iceberg. We're, we're Florida boys. I mean, yeah. I mean, how often do you get out there? you know, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> well, we were worried that that was going to be the only iceberg we saw. Now, when we got to Greenland, there's icebergs everywhere. I mean, everywhere, everywhere you can possibly imagine. Um, there's just icebergs. Just, In fact, when we arrived in Greenland, we almost ran out of fuel between Canada and Greenland, and we used our small motor. We had a little tiny 9.9 uh, .9 kicker that moved the boat about two miles an hour. We went, we went the last 180 miles because we did the calculation. We got better fuel economy with the little motor than we did with the big one. So we're using the little one. Now, you have to understand we're on the edge of the Arctic Circle. Okay. The, the wind is blowing at us from the north. Okay. And uh, the, it was just freezing to death. And one guy would lay down and throw all kinds of blankets on him and try to sleep. And the other guy would drive the boat, just wrapped up as, as much as you can be. And you literally... One laid on the ground, and the other one put his feet on top of the other one while you're driving. The boat. Wow! Well, we did. So when we arrived in Greenland, we're using the little motor. It's foggy out. So this is just a super foggy out. It's the still. There's not 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 a ripple in the water, and we're mm -hmm. zigzagging in and out of all of these tiny little. I mean, great big icebergs. We're looking for a harbor. Now you have to understand the harbor is a town uh, called. Uh, Kakatak. Uh, it's not necessarily not Kakatak. Uh, Kasamut. Kasamut is uh, has 36 people that live there. And it's not like, I mean, this is a little, not like here in Florida where there's, you know, 2 million boats. Okay. Yeah. 
in, in, you know, there are 18 million people that live here. Um, this is a town of 36 people and it's a little tiny town behind an island and we, and, and, and a GPS, when you get way up north, GPSs don't work very good. They're off a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, compasses are off a little bit when you're way up north. And so we're trying to find this place or, and literally we're out of gas. I mean, we are out of gas. Um, literally less than a cup. Okay. I have more coffee. Actually, I haven't any coffee. I have some more drink in this cup right here than we had. Oh, my cup is green. You can't see it because of a No, I was going to say there's a, a floating brick wall. <laughs> I didn't realize it. Okay. It's the it cup is green. Okay. <laughs> and so you can't see it with the green screen. But uh anyways, I have I have more drink in that than I had gasoline left in the boat. So the we, we started off from from Canada, a place called um I forgot. Anyways, way up north in Canada and started coming across about 600 miles, which for us, the range on that's about 1,000 miles with good weather. But the weather report said that we were going to be three to four foot seas. Uh, now, you think in meters. Do you think in meters or feet? Yes. Meters? Meters. meters yes. One and a half meters. Okay, nothing. One and a half foot meter, one and a half meters on both sides of the Davis Straits. Okay, also known as the Sea of Labrador. Okay, they... They said it was just going to be, you know, really small waves, calm seas. So we did not fill the boat with gasoline because it travels faster when it has less fuel. And so we didn't fill it up because the weather report said we were only going to have about a meter and a half of waves. They lied. The waves weren't a meter and a half. They're like 12 foot. Um, and they said 12 foot is like three meters, four meters. Yeah. Okay. Uh, four meter waves. And the, um, the weather report said they were coming from the southeast. Instead, they were coming from the east. And we're going directly into these big waves, a lot more wind. And the, obviously, we're using a lot more fuel than we anticipated. And we did not top off the tanks because we thought we were just going to day and a half to zip across. So we're out there six days in this storm uh, that was on nobody's record books anywhere. So we're just heading across. Um, it, it's scary and fun at the same time. Yeah. So we got out there and we have what's called a sea anchor. Now a sea anchor is a parachute that you throw in the water. It's nothing but a parachute in the water. And it causes the boat to face the waves or to face the wind, which is usually the waves too, usually the same mm -hmm. direction. So the boat takes them really good. So we're getting out there and we're using a lot of fuel and we're, I'm thinking we're going to run out of fuel. So mm -hmm. we need to just wait for the storm to go away. And we start praying, asking God to give us, God, please give us wind from behind us instead of wind in front of us. We're praying, literally. Uh, the Canadian Coast Guard offered to come get us 400 miles. And I told them no, because we have to finish the mission. You have yeah. to. You can't not finish. You know, well, what if you die out there? We're not going to die. And if we do, so what? I mean, it's not my problem if I'm dead. Somebody else's problem. <laughs> My wife doesn't me when I say that. No, she, you better hope she's not watching this. <laughs> she, she, I'm sure she will eventually. Yeah. Okay, but it's not my problem. I'm dead. It's somebody else's problem. Um, anyways, I'm going to heaven. So, <laughs> um, anyway, so we're way out there and uh, we're almost out of fuel. And I said, Bob, you know, um, let's throw the sea anchor and maybe the storm will go away. Mm. And so we're praying that God would give us waves from behind us. Instead, the wind turned and came out of the north. Instead of out of the west, it came out of the north. And it got super cold, super, super cold. And But you know, I threw the sea anchor and Bob said, what do we do now? He says, I don't know about you. I'm going to sleep. I laid down, grabbed the sleeping bag. Bob said, I was out in no time flat, snoring away. And he's like standing there, what do we do? <laughs> I'm going to sleep. Um, but, you know, because it was that there wasn't much we could do at, at all. Uh, I mean, we wanted to wait. So the wind changed out of the north and we didn't know it. But that was a real blessing because using that little motor. OK, we were able to steer with the wind blowing at our side. We're able to steer all the way in. Now, yeah. right before we got into shore, God turned the wind around and gave us exactly what we were praying for. Wind from our behind. Yeah. Well, we had zero control of the boat. Because we only had that little motor and the wind and the waves were faster than the little motor would push us. 
Okay. And so we literally had no control over the boat. And so sometimes God gives you what you need rather than what you ask for. Yeah. Because uh, if we would have ended up using all our fuel and not be able to find where we were going. Yes. Um, and so that we, we would have ran out of fuel had we had God given me what I wanted. Okay. And then we might have been floating around the North Atlantic somewhere all by our, you know, freezing to death out there instead. I'm don't get me wrong, it was cold with you know on the edge of the Arctic Circle. There's ice, you know, you're you're coming in. But we used that little tiny engine coming through those uh, icebergs. And and Bob said, finally, I'm going to sleep. He left me. And uh right in the middle of you know, we're all I'm literally we're just about on fumes. Yeah. And um I ran across a small boat with a, a gentleman and his wife in there. They didn't speak very good English, but they did speak some English. They had a, a bunch of reindeer in their boat, and they're going to the big city, Kakatak, to sell reindeer meat. Mm -hmm. And so they did point to me where to find the harbor. So I got into the harbor, uh, this little town called Kasamut, and um, you want to talk about a miracle. Just yeah. There's so many miracles on this trip, but this one's incredible. Okay. Yeah. The police come to Kasamut one time a year. So we're in Kasamut. They don't speak English. We don't speak Danish or Greenlandish. That's all they spoke was Danish and Greenlandish. There's only like 36 people that live there, but they have a country store mm. in, in the harbor. And there's like, in, you know, people that live all by themselves, you know, 10, 20 miles away, come in to the country store all the time. And they, they speak Greenlandish and Danish. The police boat comes once a year. And they decided to come while we were there. Yeah. I mean, and they could translate for us. I mean, how incredible is that? Yeah. I mean, yeah. they and they just happened to show up while we were there. It was God, God working out details for us. The whole trip is full of one time after another, God working out details for us. Wow. So they didn't want to sell us any gasoline. They, they call it uh, benzene in Greenland. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so we wanted, we wanted gasoline. They said, you know, but anyway, they didn't want to sell it to us. We tried to explain to an emergency. And we got the idea they would sell us 25 gallons. Now, mm -hmm. our boat holds 347. So we really wanted to fill it up. But they only gave us, they, gave, they did sell us 25 gallons. And then we went to Cockatock, which was big city, and yeah. bought more gasoline. But when we got there, I, I met the same couple that were selling reindeer meat again. Mm -hmm. And it just so many different things that happened along this trip. That yeah. Just not one. But I, and I'm sorry, I'm just going on and on. About it, but the, the theme is you run towards your fears. Yes, and, uh, that's the theme. Like all of us are afraid. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you're doing. Okay, I'm not qualified to start race all the way around the world. There's never been a powerboat race all the way around the world. But I'm qualified to get help. Mm -hmm. I'm qualified to find people that are smarter than me. And in the process, I go to church and I speak at a church. And one of the vice presidents of the NBA is at the church. And he's joined our team, okay? The different people. You're out and you meet people. You met the guy that organized powerboat racing for, for East Coast, excuse me, the West Coast of Florida, world champion powerboat racing. He's on my team. You know, you just meet people and God introduces you. I met the guy that was like considered one of the best PR guys in the whole world. And I just met him by accident. He's on our team. Mm. And so when I go out and... And I ask people in the United States, and, and, and I'd be surprised how you in Australia are familiar with this story. There was a little girl that um, named Natalie Holloway that was in Aruba on vacation, a little blonde-haired girl, and she mm -hmm. got kidnapped and disappeared. And um, it became big news in the United States. Now, you have to ask yourself, thousands of girls get kidnapped every year. Why did this one mm -hmm. become big news? And it became such stakes of America put pressure on the country of Aruba to reopen a, reopen the investigation. And they finally caught the guy. They, they caught him in another country. Wow. Okay. All of that came because of the publicity around that. Well, the difference is um, the parent, Dave Holloway, called this guy, Larry Garrison, on the phone, said, I want you to, do, to handle my PR for me and to make this into a big story. Larry mm. Garrison, I got introduced to him. He's my PR guy. Yeah, the same guy that made this global story out of out of you know one out of a thousand people get kidnapped, you know, and so Americans all know this story uh, that if they're over 
if they're over 30 years old, they all know the story. And, yeah. and, 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 and Larry's the guy, and I'm not trying to, to belittle Natalie at all. I mean, it was important to, to, mm -hmm. to she was, you know, found. Uh, she mm -hmm. was not found alive, unfortunately, but found that her pa parents got resolution on this and stuff. But, but Larry did such a good job of making this a major news story here in the United States that it caused the government of the United States to go after the government of Aruba and to mm -hmm. really get everything done. And they found the, the culprit in another country. And, and, and they go, wow. I mean, just that kind of, and, and I got Larry, he's on my team. How do you yeah. get people like Amazing. that? Um, as you see the, the door open. And so, was it, you know, am I afraid to, to go out after all of it? Sure I am. Okay, everybody's afraid of all this stuff. Okay. But but you don't you know you don't sit at home and cry, you press forward. You press yeah. forward, and yeah. sometimes things are falling apart. Sometimes things don't work right, and you just keep pressing forward. Now, there's a, and I, I, I stop me if I'm rattling. I could talk story. No, look, I I loved. Um, I mean, you've you've gone and you've sequentially covered all of the points that we've mentioned. And uh, I'm just so enthralled. I mean, what an incredible adventure. I, I, I am noticing of, of the time. So what I might do, uh, Ralph, is, is there a website link or what we may do is add that in the show notes because then people can go and uh, have a look at the photos and no doubt you would have some form of um, online presence that people can follow uh your journey and, and information about you too so what's the best web link or she is it a um, long link we'll add it to the show notes um well for what we're getting ready to do it's called cup royale c-u-p-r oh by the way there are two stops in australia not one two okay um yeah. sydney and perth so yeah. uh, there are two countries that have more than one stop the united states of america and australia there so and, and our plans are going to change but um United States has two stops uh, uh, in the plan, and Australia has two stops in the plan. So we're gonna we plan to race in Sydney, and we plan to race in Perth um, as part of this. But the website's cuproyale.com, C-U-P-R-O-Y-A-L-E.com, mm -hmm. um, and the website about the one where we cross the Atlantic is crosstheatlantic.com. Um, okay. Pretty simple, cross the Atlantic. Off. And, and, and you can watch it. It's called the I Am Second Wounded Hero Voyage. It's on Amazon Prime. There's 11 episodes. Oh, wow. I'm not sure if it's av available in Australia or not. I know it's available in the United States. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's But it's 11 episodes. It's about two crazy guys crossing the ocean. You know, and, as you were sharing that, I'm thinking, man, they've got to make a movie or a series out of this. So there you go. They have. <laughs> okay. Now, the series was my brother Bob made the series. Okay. So when we got ready to go, I gave him some money to uh, give his wife to pay bills while we were gone. Instead of giving his wife any money, he bought a real expensive camera. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> and he brought this real expensive camera with him. And he filmed the whole thing. Wow. Um, and so at the end, it's edited. Now, unfortunately, there's a couple of scenes in there that we couldn't film, like the one where, where we almost died. Um, actually, we almost died about three times. Now, Bob said I almost killed him five times. I really think I almost killed him three times. Yeah. But, uh, but that's all. <laughs> I mean, we're all going to die anyhow. Uh. No getting out of this planet alive. You might yeah. as well prepare for it. And, yeah. and, and, and look at that as as something. I mean, look, I'm not racing to die. I don't want to die anytime soon. I want to. I don't have any grandkids. I have three adults, and none of them are married, and none of them are giving me any grandbabies. You know, so I'm not in a hurry to go because I really want to spoil some brats. Yeah, <laughs> get even with the kids. Okay, <laughs> spoil their brats and send them home. Okay, yeah. so I'm looking forward to those days. But at the same time, you know, we're we're all going to cross out of this planet. We're going to cross mm -hmm. the next world. And there's no getting around it. There's not one person on this earth that's over older than about 125. Somewhere mm -hmm. in that area is the oldest person. So 100 years from now, you and I and almost everybody listening to these things, we're going to be dead. So you get a choice. You can go through life afraid of that or you can mm -hmm. embrace it. You just say, hey, yeah. I'm dying somehow. 
My other brother, I, I come from a family of eight kids. Wow. Okay. So we grew up on the water. Okay. My mom and dad had eight kids in a seven-year period. So there's one set of twins in the middle. So the oldest is Chris, and then Dana and Dale are twins, then Bob, and then me. So Bob and I are the guys that cross oceans together. Yeah. Okay. And Bob's wow. part of our team for the race around the world as well. But um, but Dana and Dale are twins, and they're both passed on. Mm -hmm. um, now, Dale died of, of, of cancer. Now, that's a girl, which is mm -hmm. in most families just the other way around. And Dana's the boy. Dana mm -hmm. died surfing. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. He hit the pier. And um, he died instantly. And he was, they were able to use some of his organs to save lives. So, in my opinion, that's not a bad choice. We all got to go. Yeah, okay, no doing it. something you love, isn't it? It's yeah, that's um, the way I look at it, and you get to help somebody, yeah. okay? And it was in cold water, and so his his organs were were, were basically um, when they got him the shore, they started uh, life support almost immediately, and it took a couple of days for them to figure out who he was because he didn't have any ID on him, mm -hmm. and um, we he was in California, which is the other side of the states. We're in Florida, okay? Um, you know, 3,000 miles away, and we knew nothing mm -hmm. about it. But it made international news, which was kind of interesting. And people came from hundreds of miles away to, to his funeral, which is in, his funeral was a paddle out on a surfboard. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of all the ways to go, that's not a bad way to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, you all got to go. And, you know, you got to do something. It's, you can sit at home and be afraid or embrace things and go after it. Yeah. Um, so there was you certainly have lived, you certainly have lived that Ralph and uh, it sounds as if you're preparing to do uh, have another in incredible trip and I'm sure hopefully uh, Bob will take that expensive camera with you guys and uh, get that recorded as as well. But we might have to leave it here uh, Ralph because um, I've got another guest but it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Loved uh, hearing about your journey and story. And, and we certainly heard you share, you know, how you were able to compete with that honour, compassion and charity, what it is like to be faced with, uh, you know, certain failure and potential death and how to push on even when you want to quit. And uh, you've, you've just done that brilliantly. So thanks once again for coming on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me.